got a request the other day to do a, a video about barbells, about bars specifically, talking about equipment. And uh, I'm not an expert, I'm not a manufacturer, but I've accumulated a few little important details about bars over the years. But from the perspective of a gym owner, the user, the end user of a barbell, the barbell being used by lots and lots and lots of sometimes very stupid people. So I've got some impressions uh, about barbells that uh, might be of some use to you if you're talking about buying a bar. Uh, first off, just as a general rule, an Olympic barbell is what we're talking about here. Is uh, there's an assortment of them. This one on the bar in the bottom is a special case, and I'll talk about that in just a second. I want you to notice that all of these bars are approximately the same length. They are about 220 centimeters long or seven foot, two and a half, two and three quarter, maybe I think I've got one of them that's seven foot two, but they're all slightly in excess of seven foot long. They're sometimes just referred to as a seven foot bar. They all have got a sleeve that is designed to accept an Olympic quote unquote plate with an approximately two inch hole. The hole uh, in the plate is going to be the primary variable here. Most of these bars are manufactured pretty close to two inches in terms of the diameter of the sleeve. If the plate on the barbell fits kind of sloppy, it's probably the fault of the plate not the barbell. Barbells are all pretty close in terms of this diameter. Okay. Now, these bars all are called 20 kilo bars. They are designed to be 44.1 pounds. Now, depending on the particular dimensions of the bar itself, there's going to be a little bit of variation. My recommendation to you is that you always purchase a bar that costs a little bit of money because cheap bars sometimes end up weighing less than 44.1 pounds by virtue of the fact that they're either short, that the bar stock is not of sufficient diameter, uh, or in the case of some extremely cheap bars, they're built at 32 millimeters instead of the standard diameter, in which case the barbell is a piece of junk. Uh, I've never seen a quality 32 millimeter bar. Those are sold for, from China for gym purposes. Don't buy that kind of stuff. Now let's look real quickly at this selection of these six bars that I have arranged on this rack. These things vary in diameter. For instance, the experienced hand can grab this York powerlifting bar and tell you that it is about 29 millimeters. And the same hand can grab this old Texas power bar and tell you that it's a little bit over 28 millimeters. Okay? Now, bar manufacturers are pretty much always trying to get their barbell into the general bar park, uh, ballpark of a uh, either an International Weightlifting Federation approved set of specifications or an International Powerlifting approved set of specifications. Uh, usually we're talking about something between 28 and 29 millimeters. And I think there's some slop in the IWF specs. This Olympic weightlifting bar, this is a contest Olympic weightlifting bar. This is a York, and this is an Elico, are both slightly larger than 28 millimeters on my caliber. Okay, these things will weigh dead on the money 20 kilos. They'll weigh 44.1 pounds. And with the bar stock being the same diameter, the adjustment is going to be in the length of the bar. Once they weigh out the sleeves and assemble the barbell, the length of the bar is going to be the variable that determines the actual precise weight of the bar. 
And that precise weight of the bar needs to come in at 44.1 pounds or 20.0 kilos in order to be able to be used in an international competition. Now, let's go through these one at a time. This bar on top I have had in this gym since 1980. It is still straight. You'll notice that when I rotate the bar in the rack, there's no wiggle in the end of the bar. This is an amazing piece of workmanship. This thing has been used by thousands of people in a commercial gym for 35 years, and it is still straight. I don't know that this quality of piece of bar stock is, is available at this point in time. But this thing is an amazing bar. It is a Texas Power Bar. It was made back in 1980, I believe Buddy Caps down in Grand Prairie made this bar for the Mac Barbell Company at the time. And it has been in this gym since the gym was built in 1980. It has been abused, it has not been taken very good care of, and it is still a perfectly straight bar. Notice the color of this bar. This is the color a barbell oxidizes to when it's been handled by a lot of hands over a lot of years. It's not rusty, it is just gray. This bar has been the same color for about 30 years. Uh, the oxidation takes place on the surface of the bar and it gets stable. It's like a blue gun barrel. Uh, it's a controlled oxidation. It's produced by the action of sweat and hand oozings on the bar as it's being held at a commercial gym. This second bar is a BNR bar. It's a fairly new bar. It's probably four or five years old. They are built in Canada by York and are sold by Rogue Barbell. Rogue Fitness Inc. Very good company. We highly recommend it. They take care of you, the customer, and uh, the equipment they sell is pretty damn good stuff. They're the, as far as I'm concerned, they're the best company in the business right now. Uh, I'm not compensated by Rogue for saying that. I'm just telling you the facts. This is the BNR bar. Now, this is the same basic shaft diameter as this power bar down here. This is about a 29 millimeter bar. This is a 28 millimeter bar, okay? This one is a little thicker, this one is a little thicker. This bar I designed to be a general purpose gym bar. And I want you to notice the nice neural that this, this bar has on it. It's a, this is the best neural in the industry as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Rogue may be using this neural on some of their other products, but this is the first one to feature this particular neural impact. Also notice, these two score marks on this bar as opposed to this one. This score mark, the inside, is the standard of the International Powerlifting Federation. It is about 32 inches between sides. This is the widest legal grip for the bench press in an IPF competition. The neural on the outside is the neural specified by the International Weightlifting Federation. It is at about 36 inches inside to inside. This is the marking stipulated by the IWF on all of their competition bars. This is a power bar, therefore the inside mark. This is also a power bar, therefore the inside mark. This bar here is an old York barbell, what we call the York Classic Bar. The diameter of this bar is a little bit skinnier. It's a 27.6 millimeter under our calipers here. And in contrast, this is a much fatter bar at 29 millimeters. This neural mark is even wider than the IWF, so this is not a standard bar marking, okay? Notice that the inside bar mark between the ends of the hand neural on all of these bars is about the same, and it is about 16 inches. It varies from 16 to 16 and 5 eighths. This is also a standard bar marking. There are bars available on the market that don't come in these standard bar markings, okay? The problem with those bars is that if the bar's neural comes in closer to this, it does not leave you enough room 
for your stance inside a deadlift so that you can pull the bar up your shins on smooth metal. If you have to pull the bar up your shins against a knurl, it'll dig a bloody ditch in your shins that may never heal. I, I, it really, it may never heal. I've seen people with a wound on their shins that they maintain for decades from lifting weights. And it's uh, exacerbated by a knurl that comes in too close. You want a standard marking on the bar. All of our instructions in the books assume that you're using a bar with standard markings, especially this marking right here, because our press and bench press grips are all hung on this dimension, 16, 16 and a quarter, 16 and a half, something to that effect. All right? Notice now the difference between center knurls. The center knurl on these four bars are designed to catch the shirt in the squat and in the front squat as well. If the bar is going to be racked on the back for a squat, the knurl grabs the shirt and aids in assisting its prevention from sliding down the back. Same thing on the shirt on the front for a bar that's got a knurl for uh, front squats. Okay as most competition Olympic barbells do. You'll notice that these bars, these Olympic weightlifting bars, these very expensive lifting, Olympic weightlifting bars also have a center nerve. This is designed to catch the shirt on the front when you rack the queen. Notice the bar on the bottom. This bar is skinny. It's a 25 millimeter women's bar. It's designed specifically for use for the snatch and a clean and jerk. If these are available in your gym and you use them for squats and deadlifts, you are using the bar for something that it's not intended to be used for. This is designed to be used for the snatch and clean and jerk. They're very expensive. Don't do curls with these, okay? This is a 25 millimeter bar. It's very skinny. It has been adjusted to weigh 15 kilos, 33 pounds. And you'll note that it's also shorter. At that diameter, that's the length that it must be. Okay, now, let's go back up and examine this rack of barbells again. This is a modern Texas power bar. It's bent. This is an old York classic bar. There are millions of these made. If you can find one for $50 and it's straight, buy it. It's a fabulous bar. This is a York power bar. Note the split in the sleeve on both of these bars. It's a characteristic of York bars. When you see one from all the way across the gym, you know this is a York bar. This is the B&R bar made by York. And note that the end cap on these bars is the same. The skinny little end cap. Note that this end cap on the Texas Power Bar is fatter here and here. This being the modern Texas Power Bar. Now, this particular Texas Power Bar, being the new one, has got their new, very, very aggressive knurl. I don't like this bar, it tears your hands up. But if we're doing three attempts on the platform at Power Meet, an aggressive knurl may assist with heavy deadheads. It also may be fine for benches and stuff that, that we're, we're not really training with it. We're just doing some attempts on the platform with it. But this thing will tear your hands up pretty badly if you train with them. I prefer a less aggressive knurl like this one here. And again, this is a light knurl on this women's Olympic weightlifting bar. It's a 15 kilo bar. Now notice the differences in diameter all the way to the bottom. This is an important point. Barbell steel does not vary that much. Now you can get junk from China that will bend when you look at it. You leave it loaded at 135 overnight, it'll bend in the rack. That's not the kind of steel I'm talking about. Bar diameter is the primary variable in terms of how the bar behaves under a load. The whippiness of a bar is determined by its diameter. A fat 29 millimeter bar like this or like this is not going to be as whippy as this 27 and a half millimeter old York bar. An Olympic weightlifting bar is about a 28, maybe 28.2 millimeter 
and thus fairly whippy bar, the diameter of the bar being the primary controlling factor. Now, let's think about this circumstance. Do you see how it's possible for the knurling process to which the bar is subjected to affect the behavior of the bar under a load? If you reduce the effective diameter of the bar by the depth of the knurl, you will change the characteristics of the whippiness of the bar under load. And this is why you have a favorite bar in the gym. Little bitty variations in whippiness characteristics you get very sensitive to as an, as an experienced lifter. And everybody's got a bar they like in the gym. It is impossible to absolutely control all of the depth characteristics of the knurling process down to tiny little ten thousandths. And subtle characteristics of whippiness become obvious to an experienced lifter and thus the, the uh, preference for a particular barbell in the gym. If there's a rack of 30 bars in the gym, it won't take a guy very long before he settles in on one he likes the way it feels. In his hand. When you buy a bar, these are just some of the things that you need to keep in mind. If the bar is cheap, it is junk. An excellent, high quality piece of steel costs more, costs the manufacturer more than $125. You can expect to pay more, much more than that for a quality bar. And a barbell is the wrong place to skimp when you are buying equipment for the gym. You can deal with plate variations. You can deal with junky plates that just hang on the end of the bar. But the bar itself is your connection to the load. If you have a cheap bar, you have spent money in the wrong place. Okay? Spending money on a barbell is, the, is the, probably the number one thing you need to make sure that you do correctly. Not everybody needs a $1,300 USACA competition bar. And that should be obvious to, to those of you that, that even do the Olympic lifts. You can buy it perfectly well with a York training bar that will behave perfectly under load for the gym. By the same token, don't be surprised if spending $125 on a cheap Chinese bar doesn't get you very far in the gym either. The things will bend, they're junk, they don't behave correctly, they won't spin. Now a word about spin. Plates fit on the end of the sleeve and the purpose of the sleeve is to spin. It is not a critical factor in powerlifting where the bar is going to spin, or the plates on the end of the bar are going to spin slowly if at all. But if the, the sleeve is locked down, then any movement imparted by the hand to the outside diameter of the plate is going to cause a big moment of inertia about the shaft of the barbell, and you don't want that. This thing needs to spin freely, okay, so that the whole moving load does not impart any motion to the lifter. Okay, so as a result of that, this thing is designed to spin. Now, in Olympic weightlifting, where you're going to rack a clean through maybe 270 degrees of, or maybe in excess of that, of, uh, of spin between the pull and the rack position at the top, and the snatch also has to spin, typically barbells that are specifically designed for high-end competition in Olympic weightlifting are built with bearings at this point and this point on the sleeve so that the thing will freely rotate. This old York bar, which was manufactured perhaps 60 years ago, was equipped with bushings, with bronze bushings between these two rotating surfaces on the distal and the proximal end of the bar. Now, you'll notice that that doesn't spin very freely. But let me show you a little trick. And any bushing bar will serve most everyone except a competitive Olympic weightlifter in the later stages trying to get used to the to a bearing bar that he's going to encounter on the on the competition platform. But for our purposes in the gym, watch this little trick. This is three in one oil. 
The split in the sleeve right there allows me access to the proximal bushing and the cap on the end as me, allows me access to the distal bushing. I'm going to put a drop of oil directly down to the middle of that shaft. And I'm going to position it so that it rolls down the surfaces of that crack of the sleeve, hits the shaft, and gets capillaried up into that bushing. I'm going to do the same thing down here, directly vertical. Just a little drop of oil. Now, if I get too much, I'm going to have to take a rag and clean up my mess because I don't want oil all over this sleeve. I don't want the plates to slide any more than they're already going to. But I want you to look at this. You see the difference in the spin? If I were to put a plate on this bar, the thing might spin for a minute because of the mass rotating around the outside at greater diameter. It would be hard for you to find a better spinning bar than this old York bar with just the application of a tiny little drop of three-in-one oil every six months or so. Don't hesitate to buy a barbell that doesn't have bearings. A bushing barbell is perfectly serviceable for the vast majority of uses that you will put a barbell to in the gym. This is a B&R bar. It does not have a split in the sleeve. It has the same York end cap. So this is the way we would oil be in our bar. I'll oil the distal sleeve in exactly the same way. I'll put one drop of oil at the very middle of this thing, let it run straight down to the shaft. It will wick along the inside of the shaft and lubricate the bushing on this end. And then I'm gonna lower the bar and then I'm going to oil that one again with the same drop. Now I've got all the, all the oil going into that, that bushing at the same angle. And once again, we see that the oil presents enough lubrication to make the plates spin on the bar for the, for the purposes of most people's use of a barbell in a training environment in the gym. You'll notice that that old York bar we just had actually spins better than this brand new B&R bar. And uh, I don't know why that would be except maybe old things sometimes are better. Ladies, you might want to keep that in mind. I hope this has addressed some of your concerns. If you have any further questions, just let us know and we'll see what we can do. Thanks.